Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, The What, What is Needed to Apply Measurement-Based Care, Understanding Best Practices and Overcoming Challenges. My name is Daniel Martin, and I'm the manager supporting the Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence, and I'll be acting as, your, as a host for today's, uh, for today's webinar. I'm going to go over some housekeeping notes in just a moment, but before that, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Together, we honor the land that we are on, even though this meeting is actually taking place virtually. If you are in the city of Toronto, like I am, these are the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nations. Ontario is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements and is home to many Indigenous nations from across Turtle Island, including the Inuit and the Métis. These treaties and other agreements, including the One Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, are agreements to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. Other Indigenous nations, Europeans, and newcomers were invited into this covenant in the spirit of respect, peace, and friendship. We are mindful of broken covenants, and we strive to make this right with the land and with each other. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, or newcomers in this generation or generations past, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, learn, and work on this land. Uh, turning to the agenda, I'm going to turn things over in a couple of moments to MTS Daniels to do a more formal introduction and give context to today's webinar, but a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, at this point in time, I assume that everyone is very familiar with Zoom as a platform, but if you are not, uh, just a reminder that um, we will be collecting questions throughout the webinar and then we'll have time at the end to go through them, but please send questions as they come up. You will see at the bottom of your Zoom panel that there is a Q&A feature. We'd ask that you add your questions there. Um, there is also a chat. Um, it's hard to keep track of the questions in the chat, so we will just ask that you keep your questions in the Q&A. If you do happen to run into a technical issue, though, you can send a message through the chat, and um, Jamie, who is working behind the scenes, will try to help you out as best we can. We are also going to be posting background information on measurement-based care in the chat, as well as recordings from our first uh, recordings from the first webinars and a recording of this one. I just saw that we got a question about that right away, so this one will also be recorded. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn things over uh, to MTS, uh, who will do a more, will do a welcome and give context to the series. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone. And my name is MTS Daniel. I'm the Chief of Research uh, and Analysis at the Ontario Hospital Association. And on behalf of the OHA, um, Ontario Health, Ment uh, Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence and the University of Toronto Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation. We are pleased to host the third of the three-part education series on measurement-based care. Uh, the focus of the webinar series is to demonstrate what is needed to apply measurement-based care by understanding the best practices and overcoming challenges in the community and at the hospital level. Uh, at the first webinar, which was held back in January 21st, we heard from Dr. David Clark, the National uh, in Clin Clinical and Informatics Advisor of the UK's Improving Access to uh, Psychological Therapy, the IAP program. He addressed why Ontario should apply measurement-based care in mental health and addiction services. Dr. Clark described how integrated, integrating measurement-based care resulted in improving uh, patient outcomes and more efficient service delivery in the UK and how it started a revolution in evidence-based psychotherapy implementation that uh, expanded across Britain, um, North Norway, and Australia, and now into Ontario. For those who have missed the first session, uh, we would like to ensure that in the chat, there will be a link that you can click so you can look at the, uh, the first sessions and so forth. There was also a second webinar, which was held in March 17th. And in that webinar, we learned how measurement-based care is being implemented in clinical practice. Um, and we had Dr. Javeria Zahir, who's a clinical scientist at CAMH, and Dr. Phil Klassen, who's the Vice President of Medical Affairs at Ontario Shaw Center for Med Mental Health and um, Sciences uh, in Whitby. And they had presented to us uh, compelling examples of how measurement-based care is utilized to improve care experience and patient outcomes, both at the program level, uh, as well as the organizational level. 
Um, and again, you can watch these videos on our, our websites. The webinar, uh, on the second webinar, we showed how that while um, we can use IT to do the right things, and Dr. Phil Klassen has shown some of these things and how important uh, IT can be used to enable our measurement-based care approach. But it also showed us how you can build a culture and trust by supporting and having meaningful engagement with patients, clinicians, and program managers. In today's webinar, our final webinar in this series, uh, we're diving a bit further into what uh, is needed to apply measurement-based care through real-world examples from organizations that have implemented measurement-based care here in Ontario. Uh, our two presenters will share successes, technical solutions, and implementation considerations of implementing measurement-based care. I will now turn it over to Dr. Paul Kurdiak, the clinical lead for the Mental Health and Addiction Center for Excellence, and who's also the chair of the Addiction and Mental Health Policy at University of Toronto Institute for Health Policy and Management and Evaluation. So Paul, over to you to moderate today's discussion uh, with our speakers, and I'll come back at the end to do the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imtiaz. Uh, I'm going to be quite brief because uh, Imtiaz did a good overview, but very briefly, we have uh, two uh, different but overlapping uh, presentations today. The first is, uh, you know, we heard from uh, David Clark about the development of a learning health system for depression and anxiety related disorders in England. Now we're going to look to our own backyard and in the child and youth sector for the, you know, the development of a, a, a learning health system uh, right here in Ontario that's been, that's been highlighted as, as a, you know, as an implementation excellence. And then um, we're going to shift to Women's College uh, Hospital where my colleague uh, Dr. Simone Bigod and, and her team are going to describe how, and this I think this is relevant for a lot of the sector where, you know, uh, Dr. Vigod and her team are from the Department of Psychiatry in a broader organization, how they have thought about uh, integrating their existing measurement-based care approaches into uh, their electronic health record that was implemented at Women's College. So I think there's really important lessons to be learned there. But first, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Dr. Lina Ojimari. Uh, uh, Dr. Ojimari is the director of the SNAP, uh, which stands for uh, Stop, oh, where is it? Uh, Stop Now and Plan Model. Uh, she's a scientific and program uh, develop, she's oversees uh, scientific and program development. Uh, and she, uh, she's also the director of the Center for Children Committing Offenses at the Child Development Institute. And she and her team have really, uh, as I said, uh, done uh, an amazing job. And she's going to walk you through, you know, developing an evidence-based approach, evaluating it, implementing it, and then rolling it out. So, Dr. Ojemary, thank you very much for presenting today. I'll hand things over to you. You're very welcome, Paul, and thank you everybody for joining us today. It's a real honor to be able to share what we are doing at the Child Development Institute, in particular the SNAP model. Um, so my focus over the next 20 minutes, and there's lots of slides that I'm going to go through really quickly, but you will get the handout, is how measurement rocked our world and embracing a scientist practitioner framework within a community based setting. And it is the setting is at the Child Development Institute and it is the model is the SNAP model. I'd like to introduce first my colleagues that are with me here today. We have Margaret Walsh, Dr. Samantha Yamada, and Adam Donato, and they would be happy to address any questions at the end of this presentation. I want to thank Danielle for doing the land acknowledgement. I also would like to acknowledge that CDI, in which I work from, is situated upon the traditional territories. But what I would really like to say is, most importantly, I want to acknowledge our beautiful First Nations children who lost their lives as a result of residential schools and that the lasting impact this has had on and continues to have on the lives of Indigenous children, families, communities, and this country. 
I'd also like to acknowledge all the children and their families um, who we have had the honor and privilege of working with, who continue to share their experiences and information with us. All our partners, uh, whether it's government, philanthropic donors, foundations, business sector partners, but also our CDI SNAP team and all our SNAP affiliate sites uh, around the world, but really would like to thank this committee um, who pulled together these vital series on measurement-based care, because I can't tell you enough, and you'll hear me stress it more and more throughout my presentation, we cannot afford not to do measurement-based care. So Ontario Health, the Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence, the Ontario um, Hospital Association, and the University of Toronto, thank you again. So I'm going to share who we are as an organization. We're an organization that has multitude of different buckets um, within this children's mental health and multi-service type of organization. We have what we call children, youth and family mental health and treatment services. We have family violence services. We have what we call healthy child development, which is where our early learning and daycares are. And we also have learning disabilities and mental health specialization. But what holds our agency together, and there's lots of things, but one of the core aspects at the Child Development Institute is what we call the scientist practitioner framework. And it has evolved over the years, but from the onset of SNAP being developed 35 years ago, this scientist practitioner framework, which was in place from the beginning, which is how does clinical and evaluation work hand in hand? And they really do go hand in hand as you start to build this out. And because we do that, we also engage in knowledge dissemination, as well as more recently in the last two decades, implementation science. But what I'm going to really focus on today is this bucket, which where is where SNAP um, uh, sits. So SNAP or CDI has um, multitude of different uh, clients they see and children and families. But part of our focus over the 100 years has really been children aged 6 to 11 in the middle years. And it says the forgotten group because up to five years ago, Ontario did not have a middle year strategy. And so a lot of focus was on zero to six. A lot of focus was on 12 and up and rightly so. But somehow there was this lull. Um, and these are the middle years, the a critical, critical developmental phase. And so that's why it was important that we push this needle. So when I talk about how do we bring a measurement-based care into our work, it really is to improve what we do. And so when we think about um, service delivery, and this is what it is, it's service delivery. How do we ensure we're making a difference in the lives of children and families, apply empirically supported treatments, scrutinize our own work because we should be doing that ongoing. And the why is so that we can do the best possible service, improve clinical practice, advance the field, and really be accountable. And accountability on all levels, to ourselves, to our organization, and most important, to our clients. And so therefore, it's really about this assess our program results and act on our findings that I'm going to share with you as I go through the presentation, how we actually do that and how measurement-based care plays a vital role in this. So when we think about measurement-based care, and I love this, some, someone gave me this as I was doing training one day um, and they, as a thank you, measurement-based care can seem insurmountable. It can seem hard, but it's, and it can seem impossible or, or not but it is absolutely possible and we cannot afford to not do it. We just need determination. And when I start to tell you this story about SNAP and how we built in measurement paced care from the beginning, we did it because as you'll see from the evolution in a few seconds, we started it because we knew that evaluation was critical to good clinical care. And so we used measurements from the onset of the SNAP program when we developed it 35 and a half years ago. And we used measures such as the CBCL for with parents and caregivers, the teacher report form with teachers and educators. And all this information was then presented at the client's case conference where the parent and caregiver uh, was part of the development of the treatment plan and formulated based on the child and family's level of risk and need. So from the onset, everyone, including the parents and caregivers, the children, the clinicians and the evaluators were involved and contributed to the information 
um, and treatment plan. And that I feel is the essence of measurement-based care. So sharing a little bit of, of our journey. So what ended up happening is in 1984, Canada made a great move. They decided that they needed to move the age of criminal responsibility from seven to 12, seven to 12, because kids as young as seven could be charged earlier. And so at that time, um, there was a bit of an outcry that there were lack of services. There weren't really services. So there was a gap. And how are we gonna fill this gap? So given CDI's expertise in working with kids in the middle years, we felt that we were well suited to start to look at how we can fill that gap. And by doing so, we started to look at the literature. We started to review the scientific literature and look at what worked, what didn't work, what were considered best practices. And as a result, we started to create the program and we formally manualized it. And one of the key things we did right from the beginning is we engaged in fidelity practices. And as a result, that's how SNAP was born. So SNAP stands for Stop Now and Plan. It was established, like I said, in 1985. It is today an evidence-based trauma-informed gender-specific model. It was not when we first started. We had to build the evidence. It teaches elementary school age children with disruptive behavior problems and their parents and caregivers how to stop and think before they act and make better choices in the moment. And the proven impact, if done right with high fidelity and integrity, we know it can improve disruptive behavior and increase self-control. We can sustain change, we can reduce crime, we can be cost effective, culturally responsive and safe and build healthy communities. And the core nugget of SNAP is the strategy, which is helping children identify how their thoughts, feelings and actions are all interrelated, teaching them how to ident identify body cues, identify hard thoughts and change them to cool thoughts and come up with plans that are gonna make their problems smaller instead of bigger. And based on this, the theories within a developmental framework are cognitive behavioral, attachment-based, social interactional learning, a feminist perspective, and a systems. And it's also based within nine core principles, as you can see. Everything from the scientist practitioner model to collaboration to client-centered, and it goes on and on. The other aspect which was core throughout this was the evaluation process. And as you can see from the technique to the program, to the principles, to the theoretical underpinnings, it was the evaluation component that really got us moving. And as we develop the program, this is what we call our process measures and flow chart. As I indicated right from the onset, uh, from inquiry to screening, to assessment, to treatment, to discharge, there is a process that happens and there is measurement that happens. And as you can see, um, each piece of this information feeds into and builds the case file and, kit and builds the information process so that we can ensure that we are doing the best possible service based on the child's level of risk and need. And so you can see that every single part, whether it's inquiry to treatment to discharge, links to specific information that we collect. So as you can see that as we start to build this program and we start to engage in evaluations, we started to note that we were actually making significant differences in our pre-post assessments, which then led to more stringent type of evaluations like quasi-experimental, randomized controls, and longitudinal. Not that everybody has to do this, but it did push us in that direction. And as a result, this continued to grow and grow over the last 35 years. And as a result of the research and evaluation conducted, we are able to know what is it that we actually do do well in and target. We're actually able to decrease externalizing behaviors like aggression, rule breaking, irritability, you see that on the screen, and increase self-control, emotion regulation, problem solving, uh, executive functioning, and even parent-child uh, relationships. So the big question, how do we build a culture of measurement-based care? Well, we built it right from the onset of ha having established what we call the scientist practitioner approach or framework. It is part of our core SNAP principle. It is also part of CDI strategic goals. And it was an investment that we did from the onset. Whereas when we hired three people, three people were hired to start the SNAP program. There was a child worker, there was a family worker and there was a researcher, which was my position at that time, right, under, right out of my undergrad. So 
we need to really try to think about is when you're doing measurement based care and building this culture, you need to kind of think about what is working, what may not be working, and how does that measurement help you do that and determine that to, in order to uh, provide the best possible services for your kids and families. So we also look at identifying service gaps, and I'm going to go into the URL in a second to show how that tool was developed to help identify level of risk and need. We also continually build our network, whether they're scientists, clinicians, policy educators, to help us learn, to help us improve, to help us do what we're doing better. We participate in conferences and learning forums. And we also do things with our team and the agency like brown bag lunches, which is reviewing articles, having stimulating discussions with staff, reviewing findings. And then of course, as I said earlier, engaging in fidelity monitoring, which is critical. And I'm gonna go through that in a second of why that's important. So a natural integration of evaluation and measurement into clinical practice is absolutely doable, feasible, and needed. And what is important is when you think about that, you have to think about weighing clinical and evaluation and implementation and fidelity, because that is the key to good uh, being able to scale and implement good programs. So I talk about fidelity. So fidelity and adherence was something critical from the beginning. When we started the program, we were just one site. We were in Toronto. We we're at the Child Development Institute, uh, it's formerly Earl's Court. And we ended up saying, okay, how do we ensure that our clinicians and our facilitators are actually trained and also ensure that they are implementing the program the way it says in the manual? So we created these adherence checklists and we would be behind the mirror and we would watch the sessions behind one way mirror and we would complete these forms that looked at everything was, was the room prepared? You know, are they following the different components of the manual and what would be the rating that would they would get and any kind of notes uh, that would enhance that. And that helped us look at linking good adherence to outcome. So that was really important, which is good adherence does that lead to good outcome? The other thing as we started to progress and develop, we realized that one of the things that was different from adherence was competency skills, which is what is the competency skills of our facilitators? And how do we enhance um, what we could be doing to support their learning so that we can also uh, ensure we get the best possible outcomes. I don't know about you, but when I do training and I'm in a group of room, I can tell I would come back and I would say, gosh, I knew right away which ones were going to be successful, which facilitators would be successful and which would not. And Mark Walsh, our researcher would say, well, how do you know that? <laughs> we need to quantify that. We just can't say that, right? Because um, we need to figure out how to quantify that. So we started to develop these competency ratings and you could see their general therapeutic skills to kind of more SNAP specific skills to behavior modification type skills and time management. So these were all really important. So when we think about measurement-based care, when we think about it, it forms individual treatment planning, enhancement to model and service delivery. It can demonstrate impact and cost effectiveness, which also leads to policy changes, helping to get programs designated as evidence-based and program scaling, which equals more impact. And sometimes when we start, we think there's a clear path that goes just straight ahead. We're going to do this. And that's great because you want to be positive. You want to you want to have your 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 cool thoughts in your brain um, and realistic. But the reality, sometimes it is not as as clear as we think. So there are challenges and challenges start with there needs to be resources. Uh, to be able to do this uh, work. As I said, at, from the very beginning, a researcher slash evaluator was built in to this very small program that started with three staff. One was a family worker, child worker, and one was an evaluator right from the very beginning. And that built the culture of the scientist practitioner framework. We need buy-in and buy-in needs to be everything from your board to your senior leadership, to your team, to your entire organization. And there's an issue of lack of trust sometimes in the process when you do measurement-based care, because a lot of times we'll get, well, what is it being used for? And so it's not about just collecting measurement for the sake of collecting it. It's collecting measurement first and foremost for treatment planning 
And then secondary use is for outcome monitoring. And so a lot of times you have to build that understanding so that staff don't feel that, well, you're evaluating to see that I'm doing okay, or is it you're evaluating for some other purpose? So it's really a process of building trust. There's also about complexities. Every agency is different. Every applied agency is setting is different. So we have to think about the individual complexities that go along with that. And then competing priorities of clinical needs. We hear about measurement fatigue, for example, in the previous presentations. So we really have to invest in measurement and practice. It's not one or the other or competing. It has to be seen on the same even playing field. And it's again about leadership vision, shared values, expertise, diverse stakeholders, funding, and any kind of ethical issues you may have to deal with. So early keys to success for SNAP really had to do with prioritization, commitment, and investment from leadership. So the ED at the time who hired me had this vision of we need to do this and we need to do it right. And we need to be able to determine that we are giving our kids the best possible services and their families. So the scientist practitioner framework was developed right from the onset. Measurement was to determine what are the risks and needs and to share best practices. It was based on collaboration, ensuring a learning culture and building university partnerships. And the forward momentum piece is really, if I had to give you any advice, just start. Just start using measurement based on what you're targeting. You can use logic models, measurement and process flow charts. I'd be happy to share ours. We can start, you can start measuring to determine what is working and not, and just start small and don't be afraid to think big. So gradually work towards more sophisticated measurement. And what we did was we established this barometer to help us track and guide our process. And really the barometer track things like program planning things, like using a logic model, lit review, to having uh, manual fidelity pieces, to process evaluation pieces, like do you track referrals, admission criteria, utilization rates, cultural competency, to more and more stringent from everything from client satisfaction to pre-post, and you can see all the way up to cost benefit and implementation science. So when we started this process, this is our SNAP's Comprehensive Children's Mental Health and Crime Prevention Framework. We started with the SNAP program and over the years we evolved based on our measurement, based on our understanding, based on client needs. We knew we needed a better way, even though we were using standardized measures, we didn't have anything to assess level of risk. And so also this referral protocol of how to get kids to the door. But I'm gonna focus here because I'm realizing I'm getting out of time here. Um, so I'm gonna focus here. So the EARLs were, um, were our structured professional judgment that help us to assess level of risk and need in our clients. And really they were developed to fill that gap in our understanding of which kids needed what and why based on their level of risk, which help with dosage. And I love this saying by Pia Ennebring, a colleague in Sweden, she says, qualitative findings suggest that the tool was especially helpful in providing clinicians with a thorough assessment process, a guide to gear the treatment interventions, and a barometer to evaluate whether a child was still considered high risk at post intervention. So really it's about how measurement leads to findings and how findings lead to improved service delivery. I'm gonna finish with these last few slides, which is an example of exactly how that works. So in one of our pre-posts, we we're realizing we we're really doing well with our measurement-based care. We were using the CBCL, we were using the EARLs, for example, and other measures. We realized we were really doing well with our low to moderate risk kids. This is 70, which means on the CBCL, that means you're doing worse than 98% um, of kids your age. So there's a clinical cutoff. You can see that the kids who receive standard care seem to do okay for the moderate to low, but the high risk kids were not. But they seem to do better with this enhanced care. And that was my question. Are none of the kids doing better in the highest risk category? Like the highest, highest risk category. And we realized that there was. The kids who ended up getting individual counseling and befriending actually did better. And so I'm going to show you what ends up happening. We also found out from another one of our studies is that one item on the child behavior checklist, cruelty, meanness, and bullying to others, predicted future offending, two and a half greater probability. And so as a result, 
We are now able to make upfront treatment recommendations based on standardized measures. And raising the bar even further, we developed a system. And the system not only helps us with scaling, but helps us do good program delivery and analysis reporting and helping all the SNAP sites do the same thing and build a culture of measurement-based care. So it's everything from pre-implementation to implementation to case management and an evaluation portal. And I'm going to go a little bit faster because I need to end. There's also a video portal where all the sites will, this is to do the good fidelity monitoring and evaluation, which is they insert their videos into the video portal we evaluate them, we give them a rating, and we look at adherence as well as competency skills, which is excellent. So this is the system that we developed, the SNAP implementation tool, which is, it helps us automate all our evaluation processes. So all the standardized measures are in, in the system, and as a result, they're easy to rate and use, and you don't have to do data entry and all these other things. So here's a finding, remember this, the highest risk kids and the kids who are on that one item, the system creates these reference guides. And Adam and Mark could answer any of these questions for you. And in this, all the information that we collect, whether through the child interview or the case conference or views and expectation of treatment or the EARLs or goal setting, they continue to implode and fill in and create these reference guides. And as a result, we're able to now create these information pieces that the system is able to help the clinician tell you which kids should get, for example, individual befriending as part of their treatment plan. So what it does is it pulls together this, which are the items on the EARL that were flagged, the one CBCL item, and if you get a total of eight, you then are automatically assigned a special friend, like an individual befriending and mentoring. And then it also provides the clinicians with these great evaluation clinical summaries from time one to time two, which is pre and post, and which is moving in the right direction, which is changing, which is not changing, so that they can look at good treatment planning. So I'm gonna end with this, that a few key points, measurement-based care, it is possible. It is possible. And you need commitment from your top and engaging practitioners and scientists in the process is critical. Feedback mechanism needs to be in real time. You can't collect this information, measurement, and then have clinicians wait for it. It's just not gonna work. As demonstrated in SNAP-IT, it can be really effective when it happens because it feeds the clinician immediate real time data and what would be helpful clinically. And building a supportive network, we just can't afford not to engage in measurement-based care. I love this quote, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So leaving you with this thought, each of us can really make it sure that children and youth and families get the best possible and available treatment. Focus on what works. We can do better, Karen Minden. Let's raise children who won't have to recover from their childhood and Pam Leo. And as a result of that, we cannot afford to not engage in measurement-based Don't care. Don't forget to use your SNAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ojemary. That's, uh, you know, 35 years of uh, program development in 20 minutes is, uh, is an impressive yeah. feat. <laughs> Thank you. I know I did go quite quickly. It's very difficult to try to tell that huge story in such a small time period, but we would be happy to address questions or provide further info. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have time uh, at the end of the panel. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over to, to me. She's uh, Simone, uh, uh, you know, an amazing colleague and a dear friend, but she is Dr. Vigod, the head of the Department of Psychiatry and an associate professor at the Uni University of Toronto. And she's going to introduce a member of her team uh, to walk us through her presentation. Thank you, Paul, for such a kind introduction. As Dara puts the slides up, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Dara Desai, who is the manager of uh, clinical applications, IMIT at Women's College Hospital, and is also a professor in uh, the health informatics postgraduate program uh, at George Brown College. And together, she and I, as well as our team, who you will meet uh, on the panel, wanted to build on the presentation uh, that we just heard to give you a bit of a deep dive into a couple of the things that we're doing at uh, Women's College Hospital in this area of measurement-based care. 
So uh, we're going to do a, a case study around some of the measurement-based care work that we're doing in uh, pregnancy and postpartum mental health. So go ahead and advance the slide. So Women's Virtual is uh, Women's College Hospital's uh, approach to virtual care, uh, which uh, you may be surprised to learn actually started pre-pandemic. And the whole concept is that you know, we want to use technology, but not just for technology's sake. So the idea is, is what is the clinical or health service problem that we want to solve? And then how could we leverage technology to do that? And so the, these concentric circles just show, you know, kind of the, the layers from the out all the way in, in terms of how we use virtual, either asynchronously to connect uh, patients with what they need, to connect providers together, and then to use live and asynchronous virtual care services, which is where we're getting into today, as well as, of course, our face-to-face -face healthcare inside the hospital. So advance the slide. Some of you may or may not know that there are close to half a million births every year in Canada. Um, and this has been, I think, in the media a little bit more uh, potentially during the pandemic, but it is thought that up to one in five uh, women or pregnant or postpartum people are affected by mental illness such as depression or anxiety uh, in pregnancy in the postpartum period. And based on economic analyses, we are talking about impacts not just for people who are struggling in terms of their own uh, potential for chronic mental health issues if untreated, but also impacts across generations. The issue is that there's quite a bit of evidence in Canada and around the world um, that one in five women or fewer receive treatment uh, that remits their illnesses. So next slide. There is a piece of very good news for people who have milder illnesses, psychosocial supports like peer support groups, uh, therapist facilitated uh, support groups can be very helpful as well as other you know, non-pharmacological and behavioral strategies. When people have more moderate levels of illness, um, psychological interventions, especially cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal therapy have a lot of evidence for remitting illness. And for individuals who don't have a remission of symptoms with first line psychological treatments or who have very severe illness that needs to be treated acutely, we have effective biological treatments, uh, including medication. So most perinatal mental illnesses are treatable, but I've just told you that most people are not treated to remission. Uh, and herein lies the gap. So next slide. You know, I would say that it is, I've been doing this work, uh, the Reproductive Life Stages uh, Clinic at Women's College Hospital uh, for close to 15 years now. And I would say it's really not uncommon in the clinic to hear a story that goes um, sometimes like, you know, I've never struggled with uh, depression or anxiety before. Um, but during this pregnancy, I am, um, you know, during this pregnancy, I'm, I'm so anxious, I'm having panic symptoms, um, or, you know, or in the postpartum period, I, I feel disconnected with my baby, I can't sleep even when the baby sleeps, you know, and, um, you know, I've done already, um, you know, the group therapy, and I, I can feel like it's, it's not logical, but my logical brain just, just isn't working. And, you know, what do I do next? Do I continue with therapy? I really don't want to take medication. I'm worried about, you know, the potential impact of medication on the fetus or uh, on breastfeeding. Um, and I really don't know what to do. And, and I'm suffering. The next slide. You know, so the question is, well, how, how would measurement-based care be helpful or be a solution in this situation? So, you know, and uh, we, I mean, this, the, all of the people who are attending today, who've attended the first two webinars, who just heard uh, Lena's excellent presentation. I mean, I'm, I'm distilling down a little bit, but this is the way that I, I think about measurement-based care and some of the definitions that I really um, that we've really based our, our rationale around what we do at Women's around this. So what we're talking about are systematic evaluation of key clinical outcomes, including symptom severity, but also levels of functioning before and during an encounter to inform treatment, to really try to provide a precise and consistent assessment of progress over time and inform uh, clinical decision-making. And as you are all aware, 
there is, are ma there's mounds of evidence, um, you know, about the superiority of patient outcomes versus usual care um, uh, for measurement-based care. So, you know, I consider this our, our kind of checklist. You know, we need a routinely administered measure. We need providers to review that measure. We need patients to review that, those measures. And then the patients and the providers need to collaboratively reevaluate so that they can move forward with the treatment plan. So next slide. In the, in the perinatal period, you know, one of the major rationales here is that it would be our hope, and, and in fact, there has not been a trial specifically in the perinatal population, but it would be our hope that measurement-based care could increase the likelihood that effective treatment decisions are made. So, you know, the patient who's asking me, like, do, do I wait longer? I think I'm improving. I'm not sure. I, you know, it, it gives you a little bit of, of you know, a, effective, um, you know, to decide, you know, am I, you know, what are, what are some elements? Do I see uh, improvement over the therapy? Um, you know, if I'm going to try a medication, if I can see that my scores just simply haven't been decreasing, haven't been decreasing, haven't been decreasing, is that going to make me feel a little bit more comfortable about, you know, the potential exposures of medication to the fetus? Um, if my provider thinks that the benefits likely outweigh risk. The other issue that we run into in the perinatal period is um, medication dosages that people take the idea, you know, of we should be at the lowest effective dose and forget about the effective uh, word, right? So, you know, we shouldn't be at a dose that's too low for effect. But again, there's a lot of worry, um, not completely unfounded about medication use in this population, as well as uh, medication dosages. So if we're measuring, maybe we would be able to, to have some more objective information about medication dosages, when medications would be changed, if they're not providing enough benefit. Um, and that people may also, the other thing we see in this population is a lot of early treatment discontinuation. So the other question might be, would, um, you know, would there be more acknowledgement by patients and providers of treatment benefits for people to maintain treatment? And perhaps there could be other benefits. And these, by extension, would improve treatment outcomes and then start closing that gap um, between, um, you know, the people who are suffering and the people who are fully treated. Next slide. But there are some barriers to measurement-based care, as I'm sure you all know. So if there's administrative burden on patients and providers, if, you know, if measurement isn't embedded within you know, existing documentation pathways, paper and pen scales, I can tell you, you know, whether or not you know, taking a, a, a new mom who's barely sleeping and has a baby and is trying to juggle and who's honestly just trying to get to her appointment, the idea of either getting there early to fill out a scale or, um, you know, or having to take up the time in the, in the visit or having to remember to do it at home and bring it, um, you know, this is hard for people at any time. And, you know, one might even expect barriers to be greater in perinatal populations. The other piece is, um, you know, there, there have been barriers recorded about, you know, it takes time also out of the visits for providers to enter symptom scales into health records. Um, time and effort that many providers have expressed could be otherwise spent seeing another patient or providing additional treatment. So next slide. We in alignment with Women's Virtual um, really thought about how could we use technology able, enabled measurement-based care uh, in this population, uh, particularly in this tech savvy reproductive age population who might rather, you know, on their way there, they can quickly fill something out on their mobile app. Um, and maybe we could function things for providers as well so that they didn't have to have as much effort. So next slide. So what we did was we set up, and this is what we're going to show you today, um, is we set up this um, this procedure, which we are, you know, we, we're, we've embedded questionnaires all over the hospital within our MyChart system. Um, but what we've done specifically here is we decided that there were uh, four uh, short outcome measures, which we worked on actually with um, patients to figure out um, how long it would take them to fill them out. So it takes a maximum of 10 minutes. One of the scales is optional, it's only if they're on an antidepressant. Um, and what happens is they get, and what happens is, is in the medical record, 
um, the clinician just has to turn on a flag. And then automatically, before the appointment, the patient will receive a message in their um, account saying, reminder for your visit, you know, please log in and fill out some questionnaires. And then they will, you know, they can go in at any time prior to their appointment. And then what the provider sees is uh, a, a full flow, which you'll see into the patient record. And it can be uh, graphed with progress over time so that the patient and the provider can um, can collaboratively uh, make decisions about treatment based on this. And, you know, and we are, we're doing a randomized trial right now versus uh, care as usual, and then looking at outcome measures as well as a whole slew of process measures, uh, because as you might imagine, this is a, a pretty major uh, implementation fee, uh, both on the patient and provider side. And so we think that, you know, this is essentially our way to check off all our boxes of the MBC checklist. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Dara, who is going to show you our EPIC uh, electronic medical record system um, and uh, give you a bit of a visual of how this works and then a little demo and we'll go from there. Great. All yours, Dara. Thank you, Dr. Vigod. Um, hi, everybody. So. I will be presenting to you how it works in our EPIC system. EPIC is our electronic medical record that we use at Women's College Hospital. And there are three things that I like to highlight uh, in the demo, and I'll go through the slides and I'll, I'll actually give you the live demo as well. The first one is patient flag and visit type triggers that how these uh, combination of these two is triggering the questionnaire in the patient's chart automatically. The second one is how patient is viewing uh, the questionnaire and how they're filling it out. So it's basically the patient view. And the third one is once patient fills out uh, this questionnaire, what does provider see in the electronic medical record uh, and in EPIC? So these are the three things that we're gonna focus on in the, uh, in the demo. And when I'm doing the demo, it's gonna be very busy screen. So just to help you, I put some slides together in terms of just to show you that these are the things that, you know, I would like you to focus on uh, in the busy screen. So patient flag and visit type, that this is a combination that would trigger the questionnaire in the patient's file. And patients will be able to fill out this questionnaire via their My Health Record portal. Um, whether from their mobile, which is very convenient as always, um, or the computer login as well. The next step is uh, how would patient view uh, the questionnaire? This is just a quick screenshot of how patient would view the questionnaire and once the patient completes the questionnaire, what does the scoring look like? Um, and also once patient completes the questionnaire, what does status look like which says completed? And last but not least, it's gonna be a provider view of questionnaire and provider view of questionnaire contains two views. One is multiple provider schedule. When provider opens a schedule, this is exactly what it looks like, uh, where provider will be able to see what kind of questionnaires that are assigned to the patient and what is the status of the questionnaire. Um, and the status of the questionnaire when provider opens right before the visit, they're able to see that it's completed. That's what you see on the second screenshot. It says QNR status. So provider would know that, hey, you know what, this patient is coming and they already completed their questionnaire. Just in case if patient does not have any questionnaire assigned, a provider is also able to assign the patient questionnaire uh, by on the top button here, it says assign questionnaire, which is a really cool feature, just in case for some reason it's not triggered and the flag is not added, we're also able to do it manually. So this is a second part of provider view that once provider opens patient's chart, what does it look like in the synopsis view? Synopsis view is basically, it allows to see results over time in a table and a graph. So it gives a really nice visual uh, to the provider. So with that, I will share the live demo to you guys. And just bear with me while I'm pulling up the screen here. Okay, 
So this is what our electronic medical record EPIC looks like. We have a test Amit patient here. He's one of uh, my colleague here and he's happy to be here as a test patient. Uh, so basically this is the visit that is booked uh, along with the, this flag that is highlighted in the yellow. In the system, we've created this rule that would trigger the questionnaire automatically for the patient. So when this visit is booked, it would tr trigger the questionnaire in patients, my health record portal, and it would give them notifications that, hey, you have a questionnaire to complete. Please go log into your account and complete the questionnaire. What does patient see when they open their account is because this is a test patient, you guys will see a little bit of extra screen on the side, but actually what patient would see is only in between the white screen that you see, the questionnaire for a meat test. This is what patient would see. For the purposes of the demo, I completed the other questionnaire. I will show you the last questionnaire, EPDS. Um, what would patients see? So when they click on starting the questionnaire, it would give them the consent. Um, and they would say yes, and they can continue. So this also, uh, you know, satisfies our privacy requirement. Um, so I'm just going to complete the questionnaire here quickly for the demonstration purposes. And once the questionnaire is completed by patient, this is what the scoring would look like. Um, it's a really nice screen, uh, gives a really nice visual to the patient as well as where they stand. And then um, they can submit. Once they submit, the questionnaire would say completed status. And now I will log in as Dr. Vigod in the system uh, to see how it would look like from the provider point of view. So this is what the provider screen would look like. It says assigned questionnaire, the number of questionnaires that are assigned to the patient, the status that patient completed the questionnaire. So now provider is able to go in the patient's chart and they're able to uh, continue the visit. So here we have a nice synopsis view. Um, and in the synopsis view, you are able to select up to four options here. Uh, for the purposes of the demo, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna select one option. And this is what the graph uh, basically would look like and gives a really nice visual um, of like, you know, where patient is standing, their progression of the visit type and however number of times that they've done questionnaire providers will be able to see it. They're able to see up to six months of a graph um, and they can update the date wherever you, they like to update it. One thing I always say about Epic, and I'm gonna be a little bit biased <laughs> because I work with the system, uh, is Epic is a beast. It does have a lot of great functionalities to be able to enhance a provider and a patient experience at the same time. So uh, leveraging the technology, uh, technology is, is, is really a great way. Um, and in conclusion of this demo, on behalf of clinical applications team and virtual team, uh, one thing I will say is we're very happy to build out this workflow for the Department of Psychiatry. And this ultimately enhanced both patients and provider experiences. So i um, very happy to be part of this. And let me just stop sharing this and I'll just go back to the slides. Give me one second here. Thank you. And as you're pulling that up, you know, something that we can talk about in the panel, is, which, um, which we didn't show there was that, you know, you can see in the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale, which is a, a validated scale for pregnancy and postpartum, that there is a question about uh, whether a person has had thoughts of harming themselves. And I know that that's been a, you know, a discussion about privacy and risk, um, you know, when, when, when we're asking people prior. And so we actually do have it programmed in um, that if someone answers that, 
um, they will actually get a pop-up with uh, some crisis information as well as a reminder that it's not being viewed in real time. And we can talk about that a bit later. But for now, I will just move to our thank you slide. Just wanted to get all the names up here of people who uh, contributed to this and there are even more. Um, and uh, we are gonna be joined in the panel by Neha Patel from our privacy and risk team, as well as Laura Poos and Ian McMillan from our women's virtual team uh, in case people have questions. And that is all technology in service of a healthier and more equitable world. And we'll let you know at some point the results of our particular case study. Well, thank you very much, uh, Simone. Uh, and so we now have uh, the panel session and I have the, the privilege of, of, of kicking it off. There's, there's lots to think about, but um, I, I was thinking, um, particularly Simone, when you're talking about, you know, the, the process of measurement-based care and, and, you know, thinking back to David Clark's presentation where, uh, through the measurement of care delivery, he was able to find out, for example, that, um, that, that the simple act of waiting for care has an impact on outcomes. So he, he showed this, this graph that showed that the, among those individuals, I think the cut point was about five or six weeks, where after five or six weeks, independent of the quality of the CBT offered, individuals are not going to respond as well as, as uh, if they were treated earlier than that. And he also found out surprisingly that, that uh, a lot of individuals were stopping treatment at six weeks, which as a CBT researcher, before becoming a kind of a health service researcher, he would have viewed as a bad outcome, but he looked at the outcomes amongst those who were uh, ending at six weeks and found that many people were getting exactly what they needed in six weeks. So all this is to say that, that when you go about measurement, it not only helps you with the individual care, but, but the process measurement allows you to learn things. And Lena, you showed that the measurement framework allowed for you to understand that enhanced SNAP actually was a, pr produced better outcomes amongst kids with the more severe spectrum of presentation. So that's a long preamble to my question. My sense with the measurement-based care is that for those of us who are, who are students of it, who believe in it, who think that it's, it's actually the only accountable way to deliver care, it seems obvious that, that measurement should be integrated in, into sort of everything we do. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is that in the, in the slide that you showed up, showed uh, Simone, you described it as a, as a process and I'm wondering if you could comment on the the sort of the flip side of, of course, you should do measurement based care, which is from clinicians who would feel as though the measurement process suggests that the care that they're providing isn't good enough. That, that what is what is wrong with the, the care that I'm providing, uh, you know, just now, like, you know, why, why isn't what I'm doing good enough. And I'm wondering if you've, you've had experienced resistance collectively in your organizations? Sure, I can take that. Should we put everyone space yeah. for the panel? Should we bring everyone in who's going to be on the panel? And I think that's a great, great idea. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, when we, so we did a lot of socialization uh, of this model uh, prior to starting. Um, and it, it is exactly as you said, right? I mean, I think the, you know, there were a number of concerns, right? A number of concerns, which Lena also mentioned, right? Are people, people feel a little bit like, well, wait a minute, is my treatment being evaluated? Right, right. There was a lot of discussion also about is the, is the, is the treatment effect being reduced to a number, right? Like, how do we, how do, maybe the numbers on these scales that you selected aren't moving, but like, how does that kind of, you know, uh, change, like, you know, what are we reducing it to? Like, maybe we're not measuring the right thing. I think people also felt, you know, with the patients feel reduced to a number. Um, and so a lot of the early socializing was actually around understanding the measurement piece as part of it, right? It wouldn't make any sense to treat this like a, um, like, like a lab value. It, it's part of a context, right? So, you know, if somebody is saying, I feel amazing, 
and their scores aren't going down. I mean, you want to figure out why that is, but you, you know, you know, I think, you know, I think once people felt more comfortable that the intent here was not to treat numbers, um, nor to evaluate, but was to actually have a collaborative process and incorporate measurement as another data point, that really helped a lot. I will say the whole other piece though is if it adds time and burden, it's going to be very, very hard for people to do it. And I don't really mean on the patient side, like the patients are totally happy to fill this stuff out, especially like you could see how quick it was, right? Um, but on the provider side, like people are already stretched, they're already working as fast as they can. And I think, you know, that I mean, the barriers that I put up on that slide are the, are the barriers that the, you know, um, review articles in measurement-based care talk about, right? The reasons why we know this helps people, we know it results in better clinical outcomes, never mind the whole, you know, programmatic stuff that you're talking about. Um, but but they're, if there are barriers. And so even like one of the things with Epic and then I'll stop talking is that by being able to have it so that I, now that my patients have a flight, I don't actually need to do anything. Their, their visit gets booked, they show up and they have the, and the, and the scales are there, right? Like that's really different than having to remember to send a scale to log out of my EMR and send them a thing and have a whole another system. Like any barrier we put in means less chance it's going to get implemented. And even with like what we have isn't perfect. We've done tons. I see Ian's face now. Like we've done so much socializing. The first few times I did it, I needed to have my manual in front of me of how I did it. But once you do it, then it is no effort. And I, I do think that's where we need to get to. Or minimal effort. Lena? I see you. I think, I, yeah, <laughs> I think I, I try to put my hand up because I'm usually one to jump in. So I'm trying to be, I'm trying to put my hand up. Um, the other thing, even going even further down, let me drill down because one of the questions that I got was like, how do you even know what measures? How do you even know what measures you should be using? Um, and, and then we also have to think about when we think about measurement is not all measurement is equal or fair. Um, we have to think about culturally responsive, safe, those kind of perspectives. I remember we used the CBCL from day one since 1985. And I remember on the CBCL, there was a little box right in the top right-hand corner. I don't think it's not, and it asked about race. And the client would say to me, well, what does my race have to do with that, <laughs> right? So we would just scratch it out. So you don't have to answer that, right, kind of thing. So it's everything from understanding who are your clients? What is it that you are uh, measuring or should be measuring? and then picking the best possible measures. I mean, we've been doing self-control from day one and we still don't have a great self-control <laughs> measure, for example, um, in different pieces. So I just wanted to even bring it down to that rudimentary piece of even selecting the measures that you should be thinking about. My uh, second question before I'll, I'll hand it over to, because there's quite a few uh, questions in the, in the chat is, you know, I uh, am, very aware at my organization, CAMH, that, that we have implemented a ton of things that on the face of things would seem to be very innovative. And yet, you know, I think that our capacity to tell the story of that innovation is really hampered by the, in a, like the relative paucity of evaluation. And Lena, you stress this emphatically that the, the resourcing and yeah. across our sector, I see people innovate and then sort of raise their head after you know building something out, and then realizing that you know they don't have the resources, expertise, or both to evaluate it to tell the story of the innovation. So, I guess for both of you, and, and it's quite different, right? So, Lena, you're you're a child development instrument, and you you know you've you've got you know 35 years, but you you will have had to argue for the resources to support you being able to tell the story you're oh, doing. Oh yeah. <laughs> and and Simone, you're you're sitting there. At Women's College is a department of psychiatry, and to like, let's be clear, psychiatry has not historically been, you know, first at the at the uh, first at the line in in you know getting resources in general hospitals. So, you know, just I'd like you both to tell your resource story because I think it's a really important one. And if you were to embark on this with the best of intentions, but under resourced, you you wouldn't succeed, right? 
Well, I'd love to go first, Simone. Sure. I'd love, did you say me or you? You, no, you go first. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm wondering, I'd love to um, hand this over to uh, Laura Poots, who's been our director of women's virtual. Do you want to take that, Laura, about kind of the approach to resourcing? Absolutely. I'm happy to. So I think at, at women's, um, you know, we're really, um, you know, we're really supportive of our mental health department and um, it's the, uh, our reproductive life stages program is a strategic priority for the hospital. It really aligns with our strategy. And so um, we, we really took a human factors approach with, with the work that we're doing to support this. And um, with our virtual transformation that we're supporting Simone and, and her department, um, we're really trying to assign resources and support that program preferentially. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around change management. And that's where um, the work that Ian has done has come in. And then on Dara's team as well, you know, it's dedicated analysts. So I think your point is well taken that, you know, if you don't have these results, like it can be quite, or resources, it can be quite challenging. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, the other, the other critical success factor that I would say within the department is the, is the champions that Simone has, the physician and clinician champions. I think everyone within her department is very keen to get on this journey. And, you know, the change management resources have actually been much less than we expected because of the buy-in within her department and the excitement around this type of initiative. So I think it's, um, I think it is, it is a balance of both. And we were like very pleasantly surprised at, as to how little hands-on work we actually needed because the clinicians were willing to step up and, and do that work and coach each other and support each other through it. Yeah. And with our story, I'm going to uh, ask Marg and Sam to fill in, but really it started with, when we started this program, the ED did not want to start this program without an evaluator built in. So, so child worker, family worker, and one evaluator. Over the years, we really realized we needed more resources. And I remember being at a senior leadership table saying, can we just take 0.5, just 0.5 of everybody's budget to put in for another data analyst or, or someone's do data entry or something? Because we were using, utilizing students and which was wonderful, but that was what we had to do. Um, so I'm wondering if Mark or Sam could add a little bit insight more into today um, in what we're trying to do with regards to building capacity. I don't know, Marg, if you want to speak specifically to what's happening for SNAP and how you guys are building it. Well, it, it's always that challenge, isn't it, to, to find the resources to, to make this happen and keep it moving. As you said, you can build a great tool like we have with the SnapFit implementation tool that's running the data live, that's feeding it back to our clinicians live so that they actually see change within 24 hours of entering that data. The change is analyzed and shown if that uh, child is improving significantly. But the problem is, as you all know, is, is partly implementing it out, making sure that everybody buys it in. As you move it out outside of your own agency to affiliate sites, you then also have to work on those resources, et cetera. So now it gets even more complicated. And then you have to look for champions. But all the things you're talking about are the things that you have to be on the ground working for, looking for your champions, helping advocate for resources all the time. That never changes. And I think the other thing that was cut, two other things that were brought forward was the change management piece, mm -hmm. which people tend not to, at the beginning, kept saying we're going to need major change management you know, structure and frameworks and templates, even to understand how to drive it from that lens outside of ourselves, inside and outside. So it, change management shouldn't be dismissed. I think it's becoming more understood uh, as a key piece of what we have to do to make things fall in place the way you need it. And the other piece I think is also important is the efficiencies. You have to clearly, as you were saying, Simone, how easy it is now and how it's built efficiencies for you and really help to reduce that time so that you can concentrate on what you need to do for your client, your treatment plans there based on that measurement and how to move forward with that. So these are key elements that you just have to keep bringing home uh, to, to make these things uh, move forward. And I smile because what we don't, what Mar, as Marg was talking about, the efficiency was the creation of this SNAP implementation tool that actually then helped us in real time have all the data. And I know in the chat there was a question about, you know, um, 
usage and ability to put standardized measures into the system like the CBCL or the BDI and all that. I know in our system, that was what we had to do is we had to pay for the rights to put it into the system. So all our clinicians and affiliates were able to access that measure and be able to use it. Just as an aside, there was a question also in the chat about, you know, there are a few questions in the chat about like access and equity. And, you know, I think it is important that we discuss that, right? So, you know, um, the the example we showed was, you know, the few questionnaires we're doing for perinatal. I mean, this has led to a whole, we're now doing organizational wide questionnaires. And, you know, one of the big questions is in the go forward is, you know, will we be able to get translations of those questionnaires, for example, in my chart, um, you know, for additional language access. The other thing is, is, you know, people have talked a lot about the digital divide, right? What if people don't have the Wi-Fi or they don't have the technology? You know, so, you know, those are cases where we, the, I mean, the nice thing with the electronic medical record is that even if we are asking for, we're asking patients over the phone and, you know, and filling it in or having them do it, you know, in the visit, like we can still put it into the electronic record. Um, which, you know, which is helpful so the patient can still see if they're in the office, you know, their, their things graphed in front of them, and it can still be used, you know, as, as data for the learning health system more broadly, as, as Lena was talking about. I don't know, Ian, uh, if you want to comment on, on that equity issue. Yeah, for sure. Um... And I think one of the things we would address up front is that we built actually beyond the EMBC questionnaires, about 120 questionnaires across the hospital during the pandemic for use across all of our clinical areas. And, um, you know, admittedly, they are all in English. Um, at the time, the way that Epic is built, you know, we would have to build all those questionnaires separately in multiple languages. So we have that for the future. Um, but there's a huge equity consideration around, as we've already been talking about resources and capacity in terms of building all those questionnaires in multiple languages for multiple instances of different patients. It's on our roadmap, um, but it's something that, um, you know, we're, we're still, um, we consider a challenge and something that we're continuing to work on moving forward. Um, we do have an equity framework for the approach to the virtual hospital uh, at Women's, and we endeavor to uh, to integrate that further into the projects that we're building. Um, but uh, but yeah, I would say it's an ongoing um, consideration and struggle, but something we're being very mindful of. And the last the last thing I'll say before I hand it over is uh, I was uh, interested to hear the end that your race questions were. Uh, uh, a, a sensitive point for some mm -hmm. of your some of your clients because you know as we think about our equity approach within Ontario Health and within the Center of Excellence particularly we are embedding uh, equity-based measures to allow us to learn over time whether we are reaching the populations we intended to reach and to be able to course correct through strategic outreach etc cetera, etc cetera. so if we are not getting information that allows us to monitor that over time because people are systematically not completing it. That would be, that would be an issue. So I was, I was curious to hear that. Yeah, I think I think it was the time, mm -hmm. um, and when I was being asked to present in the United States, they wanted that data. Well, we in Canada really didn't collect that data at one point, and so it was interesting to get this feedback um, of well, how do we know it's going to work for? African-American children, for example. Um, so we really had to think about this and consult with others. But today, I think it is absolutely imperative and we need it uh, to ensure that we have equitable services and that services are working. There were a couple of questions in the chat about um, how we picked questionnaires. Um, so I don't know if that would be a good thing to answer. I mean, I think for us, um, you know, the idea of having uh, questionnaires that are, um, you know, freely licensable was, was big, but also to have really, you know, the recommendations around having both symptom measures as well as functional measures um, was really important and really important to the stakeholders we consulted as well, back to the point around, you know, that, that we're not just treating a, a number or treating a symptom. And so sometimes, to be honest, we used um, a couple of the PROMIS measures, the uh, patient reported outcome measures that have been validated mostly in the UK. And for some of the ones that we're using, like I don't even look at the total number necessarily. I look at the, at the answers to the questions with the patients and see if those are shifting over time. They just have like four items each, if that's helpful for the audience. 
maybe Paul, actually people have uh, done a, a good job of, um, of uh, answering some of the questions one-on-one -on -one, and then I think uh, some of the themes, but maybe if we've got a couple of seconds, we can go to the Q&A and pull some of the live ones that are coming in. Is that okay, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. So there's one um, here that I think maybe both um, Simone and her team and Lena and her team can comment on. So I think, uh, Lena, you actually made reference to this about building this in from the beginning, but a question from um, an attendee about, you know, what happens if you don't build it in from the beginning, but you have an existing program and you want to go in and kind of like build this in now. And there's probably a whole bunch of kind of cultural um, change management things to work through, but didn't know if either of you had any words of wisdom or advice. I would say start, <laughs> start, just start. And, and Sam uh, would like to comment, but I would say start. You could start anywhere. It doesn't mean that you didn't do it from the beginning, so you can't do it now. Sam, sorry. I think in a number of programs where they're at CDI where they've been running and we've been trying to reestablish um, buy-in around evaluation, the approach that we took was to build collaborative relationships between the research and the clinical teams by going through and developing theories of change. And what that process did was um, help us to establish a culture of curiosity and, and reflective practice on the parts of the clinicians while the researchers started to get to know the programs. And then together we were able to build out um, and review logic models and evaluation frameworks and it just helped to set a tone where if you don't have that culture from the very beginning, you can invite the clinical teams and other stakeholders like clients along the journey with you with the, this overtone of curiosity and this um, excitement about wanting to ensure that you're getting the outcome that you're hoping for. Uh, another question that, um, Lena, you answered directly, but um, the uh, others, you know, it, oh, oh, sorry, actually, I realized I, I skipped Simone's group. Simone, did you did you or a member of your team want to comment on that issue of starting what happened, starting from the beginning versus starting midstream? You know, I, I don't think I would really have anything to add except that um, any movement is good movement, right? And I, you know, I think this we did start the the case study that I presented was even before the pandemic. Like this is what we decided to start with, and. It was, we did months and months of socializing of, you know, of what I was saying. And um, Laura, I think said, you know, she was surprised at how quickly our department kind of hopped to it. And I do think it was because we started, this was planned. We actually had some funding for this pilot RCT even beforehand. Um, and then all of a sudden there was this opportunity, you know, to jump on it right away. And I, I do think that, you know, I, I do think that probably is it, right? Like that's why we now have 120 questionnaires in because we just started with something. Um, the uh, Lena, this is the question that you'd uh, refer to. You'd kind of answered the person directly, but can you speak at all to things like fidelity checks that you use to um, mitigate model drift? So anything, yes. any kind of checks and balances you put in place, I think, to support long-term sustainability and perhaps evolution of uh, um, appropriate evolution of your model as you go? Yeah, great question. I think Dorothy posed that question and it was about how do you, doing good fidelity, does that help with drift? Does it help with um, uh, improvement? We built, as I said in my presentation, Fidelity monitoring or adherence to the model was done right from the beginning. Right from the beginning, we would sit, I would sit behind, I can't tell you how many times I sat behind a mirror in a dark room and I would watch snap groups um, every Wednesday or every Tuesday night. Um, and I would alternate. I joked about them building the special room because I could see the kids' room on one side and I would take my, my headphones off and I would go on the other side and there'd be another mirror there and I'd close the curtain and I could see the parent, the pair parents caregiver groups and it really was is about being able to work with your team so the evaluator became part of the team so we would do the pre-briefs with the clinicians and and facilitators as well as the the debriefs 
um, what went well and I would have the adherence checklist right in front of me. I would be able to ask them how they thought it went and then I would go through and share. And you could see a lot of times they would be so excited and it became a culture of like, how did I do this week? <laughs> Which was really a really positive way to engage the, the staff. Um, and then we also started wanting to know, does adherence li link to better outcomes? right, is, is an important question that we had. One of the things I did not get to share was, because of time, was one of our students actually did a study from the Netherlands. He did a study and he found that, for example, role plays was one of the key factors, and Mark, correct me on this one because they don't have in front of me, but it was the role plays when they looked at outcomes and looked at pre-post outcomes of each client or clients overall, it was the role plays that made a significant difference um, in, 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 in the child's development and in regarding to understanding and adopting the strategy, which was critical for us. So now we can look at a, a hit, we can look at a competency or look at a tape, for example, of one of our affiliate sites, no matter where they are, and look at the role plays and determine if the role plays are strong. We're hoping that the rest of the program is equally strong. So those were really, really important to, 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 to build in, which then linked to those competency skills, rating the staff. And I know that some people were like, oh my gosh, how did that go over with your team? But the competency skills were something that at the beginning of every group, the staff would pick one core competency that they want to work on. I'm going to work on active listening today. They're going to work on everything, but the one focus they're going to do is I'm going to work on active listening, or I'm going to work on bridging, or I'm going to work on hard, you know, challenging hard thoughts. So they would work on a competency skill. And at the end of group, they would, the, the supervisor would ask them how they felt they did on that one competency skill. So those were the kind of things that helped ensure fidelity and not, and, um, stay away from drift because drift happens. We all know that drift can and, and does happen, but it really then helped to kind of sustain and maintain the quality of the program. I don't know, Mark, if you have anything you want to add on that one. Uh, no, I, I think that uh, over the years we have refined it, to, as you said, Lena, from some of the studies that we've done to bring down the amount of time you need to review. Uh, tapes uh, for, again, we have a lot of affiliate sites, over 100 affiliate sites that our training consultants are trying to stay on top of. So um, that, that we brought it down to knowing that 20 minutes of a group you could effectively review for competencies and fidelities if required, uh, that you, you wanted to operate it that way. So there's, there's always things that you're building on and learning on as you're measuring uh, what you're doing to help improve again what you're doing. So um, maybe we'll take one more question. Um, and it's interesting, like having done three of these webinars now, there's sort of themes that come up each one. Uh, one, you know, really focuses on the change management piece. The second I would say would be uh, equity, which we've spoken to. And the third one really talks about managing things like risk. So um, Simone, there was a very specific question about uh, does, does Epic flag potential self-harm response and how you manage it? But I don't know if um, you want to, if, uh, if the SNAP team or the Women's College team just want to comment generally about, you know, risk and privacy. How do you, how did you put things in place to manage that? I think I'm going to turn this over to Neha Patel, who's our uh, manager of privacy and risk, as um, Neha and her team have really thought this through quite substantially. Do you mind commenting, Neha? Oh, thanks so much for the question. Yeah, so we took um, sort of a multi-step um, approach to mitigating some of the risks that arise when patients would potentially answer questions that um, would indicate a high medical risk. So um, not only um, if a patient was uh, answering a high medical risk question, uh, they would get a um, a notification to say, you know, any crisis intervention information that would be presented to them, a reminder that the responses aren't monitored 24 hours, um, and then also that there would be a flag on the provider side, so a message is sent to the provider or somebody um, designated to receive those types of alerts from a patient who would indicate, um, who would have indicated in the questionnaire that uh, there would be a high medical risk, um, and so we kind of work together um, as a group on um, really getting uh, the, the chiefs uh, buy-in for that as well and just sort of having a plan in place 
um, where uh, if there were any answers to these, these high medical risk questions, that there was a process in place on, on the clinical side. And, that, and also if it was appropriate to ask those high risk medical questions in the questionnaire. So perhaps um, maybe not for um, uh, Dr. Vogode's questionnaires, but for other questionnaires across the hospital, um, perhaps it wasn't appropriate to ask those high medical risk questions, and it was more appropriate to, to have them um, asked in person or um, over video visit. I don't know if the virtual folks want to speak to anything, because we work together on that. Yeah, I will just say, I think um, Neha's last point is super salient in terms of finding alternate ways to ask the questions. So, um, you know, we, we have the benefit of EPIC. So in certain uh, cases in mental health, actually, um, we've opted to leave certain questions off the questionnaires. And during the clinical encounter, um, they can ask the patient the question that was missing, and then they still get a validated score um, for that measure. Um, in other situations, for instance, the use of the PHQ-9, which I believe asks about self-harm, um, we've had, you know, concerted conversations about whether using the PHQ-8 or other versions of the PHQ were more appropriate. So we've really... As, as Neha mentioned, taking a multi-step approach to, uh, to finding different solutions for those, those issues. Yeah, and what I would say is, I mean, we also have the advantage of working in a hospital where we already have a system for critical lab values in place, right? So there already, there already is a system for kind of critical values and in a way questionnaires are, are actually no different and we have a call pool, but, right? We have, we have things in place that make it possible um, to answer questions that, you know, where, where we might not otherwise if, if someone wasn't going to get to it very quickly, right? But these, these, are, bi these are big issues we've been grappling with. Nina, do you have a, a last comment on that before we turn it over to MTS for a wrap up? I don't. I don't know if Mark or Sam would like to comment on that because it really does have to do with privacy and, and the system and all that and Mark or... We do have a, a, one of our questioners is a parent filling out on the child and asking if the child has any suicide ideation or is, has tried to self-harm. Uh, we flag that uh, in the system clearly that that has been identified as a concern uh, and we flag it in our reports that we send back to our, our teams, et cetera. And in situations where we don't have um, an IT automated system, we have policies and procedures. So we have sort of manual procedures that require our researchers to review questionnaires within a certain time frame and alert clinicians within a certain time frame if certain questions are checked. Great. I feel like I feel like the medical legal framework that we're operating in kind of acts as though the risk only the risk only exists if you measure it. <laughs> but, but of course, it's there all the time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to, so listen, I, I think this was a really great, uh, great session. Um, th thank you to both you and your respective organizations for, for delivering such, you know, eloquent high level sort of overviews of, 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 you know, really great developments fully formed and, you know, really emerging very, very nicely. And I'm going to hand things over to my colleague MTS to say the final word. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I, I want to echo what Paul just said. It was a really great session. And what a way to end our, our three-part series, our educational series on measurement-based care. I just want to thank all the speakers, the panel. A great discussion. Um, but uh, just to let you, you know that a recorded version of the webinar will also be sent to all registered participants uh, for the webinar. So you can also use that to circulate in your facilities as well. Um, we would love to actually hear from you as well. We'll send out an evaluation survey so that we can uh, get some feedback from you to see if there are further things that we should do in the future. Um, this is the last in the series, but the, it is, the journey is not finished, just to let you know. We are working with, you know, thinking of things over the summer as we start to explore how we can actually uh, learn from the great sessions that we had. What are some of the series that we can produce in the fall and, and so on. So we are having that type of discussion as we uh, go through the uh, summer and enjoy hopefully the good weather. Um, but before I end, I, I know you haven't seen a couple of folks who have been really instrumental in helping us uh, bring this series to you. I want to thank uh, 
Vivian Leong and, and Fiona Fu, who are instrumental and kept us on track. Um, you know, Paul, Daniel, and myself, we were just as the mouthpieces to this thing. The hard work was actually done behind the scenes. So I want to thank both Vivian and Fiona for helping us do this. Um, and they kept all the speakers on time. And I want to say thank you for all the speakers previous as well as today. And I do hope as you start to, to explore how we can learn and ex embellish the work that you're doing on measurement-based care, it is an opportunity to reach out to some of the panelists and even folks who have presented before. Um, so with that, I would like to end and thank you, Paul, for moderating the session. Great session as usual. And thanks to Danielle for, for helping with the coordination of the meeting today. Thank you very much. Bye now. <laughs>